I know nothing about GM, really, um, except a little bit here and there, but I want to share with you the accumulated knowledge that resides in those two books, Late Lessons, Early Warnings, because they contain about 1,000 years of accumulated wisdom, so a little bit of wisdom, a lot of data, some knowledge, and some experience of uh, 34 well-known case studies in occupational or public health or environmental health, from climate change to lead in petrol to asbestos to ionizing radiations in x-rays to non-ionizing radiations in the mobile phone, etc. And it's written in a very accessible style, even though the authors are, for the most part, key players in the history. So the man who writes the chapter in volume one, which is not here, but all chapters are easily available on the EEA website, he, he discovered the hole in the ozone layer as director of the British Antarctic Survey in 1985, Nature. And he writes the history of CFCs, the ozone hole, and so on. And in the case of the chapter that's most relevant to today in volume two, so you can read it uh, tonight, uh, on GM, it's on GM and agroecology. And I want to thank people like Jack Heinemann and uh, uh, Silvio Fundovich and David Quist and a couple of others, I can't remember, who produced that chapter, because it is a really excellent chapter. For somebody who doesn't know anything about it, I think it's fantastic. And many people who do know a lot about agroecology and GM think it's a fantastic chapter. So thank you, Jack, and the others who put a lot of effort into that. Now, I've wasted five minutes already. I'm no, I've, got, I've only got about 70 slides to share with you, but um, uh, more than half of them are hidden. So when you get the transcripts and the slides, you get 70 slides, but we only show about 30, and I'll try and even cut those down. Um, and uh, try to make friends with the translators, and I hope we can still be friends at the end of this session. Um, I want to do three things, basically. One, introduce this thing called the precautionary principle. Like, where did it come from? Who invented it? What's in, in there? And what's its relevance to the GM field? Secondly, to capture some of the essence of those 1,000 years of history in the 30, 34 case studies, some of the points that are most relevant to your issue today, i.e. GM. And then finally, uh, uh, look at this chapter uh, briefly uh, and look at the way it contrasts um, different innovation pathways to future global food security and sovereignty. It's quite different from many of the other chapters. It has a little bit about the emerging risks of GM, both to people and to environment, but it mainly sets up the, the discussion, the narrative, which people from the floor raised this morning. Is this the best way to do farming for the whole world? Question mark. And it might be. Debate. So that's what I'm going to do in the remaining 15 minutes. Um, so the precautionary principle, it's essentially got two jobs to do. The first one is a straightforward, simple one. It gives policymakers, you saw them this morning, it gives policymakers, if they have it in their law, the legal justification for taking action on an emerging hazard before it's too late. Common sense, really. But the debate is, how much evidence do you want before you take action, particularly if powerful players lose their product? Look how long it took to control tobacco, as a for instance. But the other role that it has, the second one, is that when you get a debate about risk, as Angelica nicely summarized this morning, you start a discussion about risk, but then if you're anything like human, you open the debate and think, this technology, which looks as though it could be a little bit risky, is it the right technology for us anyway? So in other words, you're now, in the second role for the PP, it opens up a societal dialogue and debate about which innovation pathway to the future. Fossil fuels, renewables, energy efficiency, GM technology, agroecology. And that's its second function. And you look at the history of um, GM in France, for example, and I summarized that a little bit in the chapter on the precautionary principle at the end of volume two where France started a chat about risk of GM, but rapidly opened the debate to the wider questions of, is it the right innovation? And now in Switzerland, you're having the same kind of debate. You probably started it also a long time ago, but I hear from what I hear with your regulators that it's still a big issue of debate. Is it relevant to what we want to see happen? The basic idea of taking action before something is too late goes back a long way, and it's common sense, of course. 
The most graphic and early example I've got is the Prime Minister of Britain talking to his cabinet members in 1846, just as the famine in Ireland was developing, saying, we should take action now to protect the poor sods in Ireland. And others were saying, no, no, we're not too sure about this because they're only Irish anyway. <laughs> and, um, and we're not certain about it and so on. And he said, better to err on the side of caution. Uh, than to neglect it utterly. So that's the basic idea. It's not a, a, a very diff difficult idea. But using that example, example gives me the opportunity of sharing with you a, a very good article that's come out recently from the kind of engineering uh, side of life. Stuff that uh, Stephen Drucker referred to in his uh, lecture. Read that article, it's excellent. Um, and in it, they, I, they, they put this little diagram just to illustrate the value of diversity, the top side of the things. If you have a diverse crop and you get blight, that was the thing that destroyed the potatoes in Ireland, the crop will sort of survive. But if you've got a clonal crop, a very monocultural clonal crop, the chances are the blight will hit everything and you lose everything. It's a simple illustra illustration that diversity usually breeds resilience and strength. But where did this idea come from? It came from the middle of Germany when a, an asset of theirs, the German Black Forest, which they valued highly, was suffering. They didn't quite know which of seven competing causal explanations was the right one, and maybe it was all seven acting together. But certainly a candidate was fossil fuel burning because of the SO2 and the NOxs and the other chemicals that came up the chimneys and dropped on the trees and damaged them. But the evidence was not certain. What do you do? Do you wait for 10 more years of research? Or do you take action? Uh, they thought, well, better if we take action, we have to cover our backs politically. So we'll invent this legal principle, we'll call it the Vorsorge Princip, which basically, <laughs> it's the accent, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, which, um, which really, as Brits, should have translated as the foresight principle, because that's a much nicer word. It sounds intelligent, it's foresight. Whereas the precautionary word for the opposition is an easy word to attack, because it makes you feel like you're a little bit, you know, weak and weary. What's wrong with risk anyway? Grow up, be a man, and let's take risks, you know, that kind of thing. So think about it as the foresight principle and you're more on track with what it really means. And it's a broad concept. And if you look up the origins of the texts, they cover things like generally re reduce all burdens, all burdens on the environment because we haven't a clue, really, what we're doing with the frigging environment. So the less burden we put on it, the better we'll be. That's now got translated, some of you will know, into a series of articles called Planetary Boundaries. Some of you will know that, which is trying to be scientific about how much stress can this planet of ours take? So it's a very sensible idea. It talks about clean production and innovation, trying to produce innovations that are inherently cleaner and less messy than the ones we had before. It talks about action, of course, where the risk is just plausible. And it talks about the proportionality principle. In other words, don't go potty with the precautionary principle. Okay, so some things, kill people all the time. Cars kill 50,000 a year through accidents and 50,000 a year through air pollution. We don't ban them because a lot of people get a lot of benefits from that. So it will be disproportionate to ban all cars because of perhaps a third risk that we might think about. So it's common sense. Uh, and also a lot of research and monitoring which I'll return to. I better speed up here. Um, it's in, of course, the EU treaty. Uh, and it's in, in the form of uh, uh, a section called, uh, I want to just model the section is called, and it just says basically um, action uh, shall be policy, union policy on the environment, which is interpreted to also mean on health as well, of course, because the two are like that in reality, uh, should be based on the precautionary principle. And then three other principles prevention should be taken, um, damage should be corrected at source rather than at the end of the pipe, and if there is pollution, then the polluter should pay you'll notice that the last one doesn't really get enforced very well. <laughs> the drawback is there is no definition of the PP in the EU treaty. 
So that means it's open house to have discussions for weeks and months and months and months. So 15 years ago, when producing the first volume of Late Lessons in 2000, we produced this um, definition, which mainly helped to increase the quality of the debate about the issue, because it correctly identifies the key issues at stake. The first point, justification for action. So the Constitutional Court can't take you to court for being, you know, a silly civil servant. Provides you with legal justification for action in situations of complexity, uncertainty and ignorance, which very few scientists talk about. They like to talk about what they know. You try asking them, would you like to tell us what you don't know? And they get very shifty about that. But ignorance, there's, there's more ignorance out there still than there is knowledge, by the way. I'll illustrate that in a second. And then it says, where there is potentially, potentially serious or irreversible threats, then take action. And using an appropriate strength of scientific evidence. Sometimes you'll wait for a lot of evidence because the con consequences of being wrong in acting, for example, suppose that we stopped smoking in uh, 1947 and it didn't turn out to be a cancer-causing substance. We would have deprived a lot of people of the pleasure of smoking. So, uh, we waited too long, of course. Um, but when the evidence is overwhelming, you just use the prevention principle. It's when the evidence is not so clear-cut that you have to use the precautionary principle, and that's why there are those two principles in the EU Act. One, we have a lot of evidence. Two, we not, not got so much. The appropriate strength of evidence can be a little bit or a lot. You choose. It's relevant, it's case-specific. So the scientists have trouble with this, because in science, Generally, and this is good, you use a high level of evidence, a high strength of evidence to say A causes B in science, which is great for science, solid foundations of knowledge. Crap for public policy. If already you're exposing millions to X or Y or the planet, you can't wait for beyond all reasonable doubt in the policy area because it's far too late by then. So scientists have some trouble with the precautionary principle because it introduces variable strengths of evidence for different purposes. Simply put, criminal law we use high because we don't want to convict an innocent person. So we give the benefit of the doubt to the, you know, the, the murderer that we think is a murderer. We, we don't call him a murderer until it's beyond a reasonable doubt. In another court where you're damaged, your compensation for his stupidity, your employer or your neighbour, Laws tend to go for balance of probabilities. 51% certain that my damage was caused by your behaviour. Because there, we ought to give the benefit of the doubt to the injured party. So it's a straight question, what are the costs of being wrong and who bears the costs? That tells you how much strength of evidence you need. I must race on now, right? So there's several sorts of evidences. I've illustrated them already with words, so I'll just push on. GM. In the directive from the EU, there it is. Member states shall, in accordance with the PP, um, take appropriate measures to avoid adverse effects. So it's there. And in the guidance on environmental risk assessment, it says um, the environmental risk assessment may not always result in definitive answers. Well, you can say that again. Um, to all questions because of lack of data for potential long-term effects in particular. Therefore, in the risk management field, you might want to use the precautionary principle to stop the public being poisoned and damaged and so on. And then at the global level in the food industry, in the Codex, what's it called? Codex Alimentarius, they make very clear that the precaution is an inherent part of risk assessment, which is done by the scientists, as opposed to risk management, which is done by these policymakers here, who have to know something about the science as well. And of course it goes on to say, assumptions used should be really crystal clear because so much of risk assessment, as you heard from Jack and many others, is based on assumptions. At least share them clearly with everybody else. There's a, a lovely document I came across in preparing for this called Beetle, which is a summary of 700 articles about the hazards of GM produced by the EU, not by uh, a bunch of radicals that you might think of uh, might, might exist, but by a very straight bunch of people, and they said, look, these are some of the things that can go wrong with GM, and we've got huge data gaps for that. Uh, huh. There's a nice piece of, of work I draw attention to you at the bottom, uh, where a very experienced ex-commission worker, lawyer, fellow called Ludwig Kramer, who set up a brilliant um, NGO called Client Earth, 
who keep winning cases against the British government on air pollution and cases in Europe on this and that. And he was asked by, um, what's that German company called? Test Biotech, to give a very detailed, considered opinion about the PP and GM. So if you want to get into real detail of this, it's all in that document and in the summary from Test Biotech. These are the two volumes that uh, you've seen the big fat one, and the little one on the left it only had 250 pages, the other one's got nearly 800. Um, and those are the case studies, 34 case studies, everything from climate change, DDT, antibiotics as a growth promoters, you can read it and go, go and uh, read them sometime. <laughs> um, they all have the same structure. When was the first credible scientific early warning? Climate change? 1896 when the physicists said, if you double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, you will raise the average temperature of the globe by about five degrees C. That is still approximately the best bet from 2,000 scientists who produce the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Research Report every five years. The current best estimate is double CO2 in the atmosphere, the global temperature will rise between two and four degrees C. Why didn't we not listen to that guy in 1896? We would have been a hundred years ahead of ourselves. So all the chapters, all the chapters uh, have the same structure. When was the warning? What did society do with it? What happened to the science? Did it get stronger? Did it get weaker? What did society do? And can we learn anything from these histories? Many of them last a hundred years. X-rays, 18, uh, 1896. Benzene, 1897. Um, lead in petrol, 1925. So we've got 50 to 100 years of experience of the interface between science and uh, policy making from which we should learn because our kids would want us to apart from anything else. In all those 34 case studies, did they ever use the PP? Well, they did, but quite, you know, not much, to be honest. So in France, for some constitutional reason, or the wine they drink, no idea what it is, they used uh, the PPE explicitly on TBT, which was a pesticide painted on the bottom of boats to stop uh, shells growing on the boats. And the pesticide turned all the sea animals from males into females. That's nice. Um, so they thought that was not a good idea. It destroyed the oyster beds, for example. So there's an economic... Uh, 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 uh. Now there's a global ban on TBT, thanks to France. In pesticides, the story on the front cover of the volume two is about the neonicotinoid pesticides and bee decline. Some of you will know something about that. The story begins in France, 1992. They spray for the first time neonicotinoids. 1993, the, the uh, honeybee keepers said, our bees are not coming back to the hive. What, what's going on here? Chatting to the farmers, the farmers said, oh, whole new class of pesticide. We don't spray this other, sorry, we don't, yeah, we don't spray stuff anymore, that slash use technology. We stick it in the seeds, and the plant grows with the pesticide in the plant. So the beekeeper says, oh, my bee goes to the top of your plant. That bee is getting some of that pesticide. Oh, no, no, Bayer said that couldn't happen. It, it can't happen, you know. Anyway, long story, of course it happens. So ban, uh, uh, France banned those neonicotinoids in 99 on sunflower and on, in 2004 on maize, which is more difficult because it's economically more important. Europe followed 10 years later. Currently, the uh, Bayer, or Syngenta, one of them, has run the European Court, uh, sorry, run the European Commission, which took the decision to temporarily ban the three neonicotinoids, to the European Court of Justice, arguing insufficient evidence. It will be interesting to see how that court proceeds. But then elsewhere, one or two things, I just rush, rush past them. What I want to spend a little time on, because it's the nearest case study to what you're playing with. So, some idiot, um, a while ago, 1940s, 50s, not an idiot really, it's the wrong thing to say. Somebody observed that in the factory grounds, the hens, which had escaped from a farm, were eating and scratching the earth, and they were growing faster, so quickly, they thought, what's going on here? And they took the dirt from the factory, which was a pharmaceutical factory, and the waste had got antibiotics in the soil. And they thought, crikey, if we could feed small amounts of antibiotic into the hen feed, and then the cow feed, and then the pig feed, and that's exactly what happened from 1950s onwards until 1965, when the Medical Research Council in the UK said, this might be nuts. Uh, could you scientists address the question? Uh, so the famous Swan Committee came out and said, it is nuts. 
You should use farming techniques to grow cattle and pigs and things like that, not magic bullet top-down bits of antibiotic. Even if it's at a, a low level that's not therapeutic, as it were, it's at a, a tiny level. We think that people will be lying in hospital in 20 years' time, they'll have eaten all this food, trace amounts of antibiotics. Some of them will be resistant to antibiotics, three minutes, oh my God. And, and you can see that he said a sufficiently sound basis for action. Read the rest of the case study. It's a fascinating story about how that early warning from the Medical Research Council was listened to for the first four years and then forgotten. And then a big farmer, big farmers came together and buried that report and reintroduced antibiotics as growth promoters across Europe until Sweden. Small farmers, consumers got together and said, Sweden, this is nuts, ban it. Banned it, 1985. Ten years later, Sweden joins Europe. Europe says, we all use antibiotics as growth promoters, so you've got to do the same. This is the rules of the game. Sweden said, well, we'll join the club, but we'll, um, we'll come back to you on that one. So they took two years to produce a fat report, and then took that to the, all the member states, and in five years, the EU gave them five years to withdraw their law. They had persuaded the whole of the rest of Europe to ban growth and antibiotics as growth promoters. A real David and Goliath thing. Nice story. Part two of it is in um, the appendix of volume two. Um, but uh, and here is the obvious thing. It's better to fatten animals other ways than by sticking in low amounts of antibiotics. Um, so the first chapter was called Resistance to Common Sense, and then I updated it in the second volume with this American professor who is upset because Europe has banned antibiotics as growth promoters, but uh, um, US and Canada and China haven't. So we're still getting that kind of, uh, and the, the volumes used are huge. They're more, it's about 80% of the tonnage of antibiotics in the US is used in the animal system, partly as growth promoters and partly as medicines when the animals so sort of crushed together get sick, which they do all the time. So a nuts idea, really. Uh, read more about that somewhere else. What are the barriers? I've got two slides. One's called Barriers to Precaution Science, this one. One called Barriers to Precaution Policy. Can't do the second one, no time. In the science, you heard it this morning. Every case study starts with very clever people asserting on unsupported evidence that X is safe. They always do it that way around. They never do it the other way around. They don't say, this is a new technology. It could be really hazardous. Let's do lots of research, anticipatory research, not done that way. So that's part of the problem. Science itself is conservative, which is great for science, bad for policy making. Um, not, not, not much anticipatory research. The uncertainties, the variabilities, which is often ignored, and the ignorance are not really taken on board. Complexity and multi-causality, as the engineers will tell you, engineers with their structures say it's very hard to deal with. In biology, it's much more complicated than engineering. Uh, as I'll show in a minute. Um, I'll, I'll race past some of these things because she's going to start getting up, jumping up and down. Three big generalizations. Three big generalizations from all of the case studies. Number one, we always underestimate the nature of the harm. It starts off asbestos, asbestosis. Then it was lung cancer. Then it's mesothelioma, and now it's throat cancer. Tobacco, lung cancer. Now, 12 cancers, heart disease, fetal toxicity, passive smoking, you name it, tobacco can do it. And in every case study, the harm always expands. Secondly, the exposures that we thought we were worried about always expand. We never underestimate the extent of exposure. It goes from workers to consumers to families to next generations to non-target species. If you produce something in a large quantity, it's just common sense in a way, isn't it? It's not going to disappear. It's going to go through its society. So exposures always expand. And the things that link them together, how much exposure causes how much harm, guess what the direction is? It's always down. So for every agent, every agent somebody clever, sets a limit and says, this is a limit for this substance. And then it always goes down. With lead, it went from 100 to now it's zero. We have no known level of safety to lead after 120 years of research. So that's sort of a problem. No evidence of harm, therefore, very often means we've not done the research. Whereas it is actually interpreted to say, I've got a very grey head, I'm a big professor, I work for the National uh, Mr. Rilbrand, and I can tell you, there's no evidence of harm from GMOs. 
And it sounds so convincing until you stand up and say, what kinds of studies have you done? And then you get the answers you got this morning. Rubbish studies, short-term acute effects, nothing on chronic. So look out for that, no evidence of harm. It just means we haven't done the research. Well, it's usually interpreted as, oh, well, there's no evidence of harm. Yeah, that's because you've not done the research. So watch that one. Uh, now, how much research is done? For this volume two, we decided to look at how the EU spends its money on three areas of technology, biotech, nanotech, and information tech. And we said, okay, drop all the research money into two columns, the money that taxpayers are paying to help the produ producers to produce the technology, first column called product development. And then we said, how much is spent anticipating, that lovely German word, anticipating, foresight, the hazards of this new technology, which might be a great technology, but how much are we spending anticipating the problems? And we were shocked to discover, in nanotech, 2%. Nanotech could be a very valuable technology, but just spending 2% now, as opposed to what the Dutch have done, have had a parliamentary debate on nanotech, and they said, 85% to develop it, 15% to research the anticipated and unanticipated hazards as a kind of insurance policy. Uh, biotech, 4%, information technology, mobile phones, vanishingly nothing, which is why you're beginning to see head cancers from mobile phones, unfortunately. Knowledge expands, as does ignorance, uncertainty, and everything else. We fill the knowledge gaps with new knowledge, but every wave of new knowledge brings its own appreciation of that vanishing stuff out there that Newton called the vast ocean of truth. I would call it the vast ocean of ignorance. And it expands bigger and faster than the research, as you can see from that little diagram. That circumference expands faster than what's in the middle. And a lot of scientists don't go with that. So we have everything goes from simple science to complex science. I just mentioned one thing in here, the third bullet down. In the story of antibiotic resistance, the establishment said, oh, really, it can't actually transfer horizontally through the genes. It can only go vertically, they said. And of course, after a bit of decent research, they found that horizontal transference was also possible. This is very relevant to the, to the GM field. So the barriers, th things that are biologically implausible, become yesterday's science. Um, and it's worth having that, I think I'll just move very, very rapidly on to where, to where, to where. So that's the chapter which is good about, forget the risks of GM, let's look at the question, is it the most appropriate technology to feed 80%, to help 80% uh, of the world's farmers to grow food, and it's not. Um, I'll just use one quote from here from Taleb Singh. When engineering is adopting evolutionary approaches due to the failure of top-down strategies in engineering, which is simple stuff, Biologists and agronomists are adopting top-down engineering strategies, called GM, and taking global systemic risks in introducing organisms into the wild. It's more rigorous to take risks one understands than try to understand risks that one is taking. So top-down is generally rubbish, bottom-up much better. You see that better. I'll finish with a quote from uh, old um, William Shakespeare, as it's his 500th anniversary this year. Uh, There's a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. So my question is, is the tide turning towards agroecology, or is it still bumping up uh, GM food? Well, I've just listed uh, eight big reports. Some of you will know some of them, some of you will know all of them, I only know half of them. And they're high-level reports coming out saying, basically, agroecology looks more intelligent and the right way forward. And there's some more there. The Standing Committee on Agricultural Research in the EU even saying the priority for funding should go to low input, high output systems, agroecological principles that use nature's capacity, that's where we should be putting our research monies. So the tide, in my humble view, not knowing the field so well as you, is turning quite rapidly now, I think, to, towards the more sensible structures of agroecology. There will be room for, for some GM, of course, but in terms of whether it's an answer to feeding the world, it's a complete nonsense. Minus 30 seconds. <laughs> um, and, uh, so, and the last bullet point there was uh, the Monsanto Tribunal, which I saw a lot of farmers came from around the world, a thousand farmers and people, witnesses, came to Holland in this Monsanto Tribunal just uh, two weeks ago, giving lots of evidence about why agroecology makes sense. And that's a picture of it. Um, and I think this is my last slide, it probably is. Um, so basically, thinking about innovations for people and planet, 
far more than for patents and power. And that probably lies the way forward. Thank you. Thank you.